All right, everybody. Hello and welcome to First Attack. I am James Chen. How's everybody going? Um, as usual, because of our amazing track record, please let me know right away if you cannot hear me nor see me. So, <laughs> but um, today, um, what I'm gonna do is uh, I, I had a harrowing weekend, so I'm very tired. So uh, what I'm going to do is just uh, go through some Ask Jay Chenzer questions and do some execution corner today. Um, and, and there's actually a few relevant questions on the execution, I mean, on the Ask Jay Chensler that I was hoping to get to because I didn't want to get to them a little bit too late. Uh, some of these questions are kind of old, so um, I do apologize to those people who have not uh, had a chance uh, to get those questions answered. And so if you've been waiting for a while, again, apologies. But I will see if I can answer as many questions as I can today. And then um, halfway through, I'm going to switch over, do a little bit of execution corner. I'm kind of excited. I got about mm, two or three Guilty Gear stuff, so I'm going to do a few Guilty Gear things. I also have a, uh, a few Street Fighter Four stuff, and if possible, I may even try to do a, a really, really old KOF one, that I, KOF 13 one that I've been scared to tackle because... Uh, wasn't sure if I'd be able to do it or not, so because <laughs> I know how hard it is. Um, okay, so we're gonna do some Ask Jay Chenzor, and uh, one of the first questions that I want to get to again, this one's kind of old, this was uh, from way back earlier in this year. But um, given that last week I did the episode on reading your opponents, uh, hopefully, most of you got a chance uh, to see that. So um, uh, maybe this, this question will now resonate a little bit more and such. Um, so I do have a question here from Mark. Um, and what he asked me was, um, you comment on players such as Daigo collecting information in the first round. What are things he tries to establish in the first round? And what methods will he take to achieve that? Well, um, if you guys remember uh, in last week's episode, how I was t t telling you, teaching people how to read your opponent. And one of the first things I did was, you know, try to establish their skill level, try to figure out exactly how, um, how good they are. Because as soon as you figure out how good they are, that tells you a lot of information already, because now you kind of know what to expect. Um, if you also remember during that episode, I said a few things like, you know, purposely throw f lots of fireballs if you're Ryu, see how often they try to jump over or how often they try to predict, um, try the same trick three times in a row, see if they learn, see if they react, and it's really important, uh, someone actually asked this on, uh, on the YouTube video, and they actually said, is it okay sometimes to take damage? to train your opponent to get them to do what you want them to do or to just get information? And the answer to that is absolutely. Um, health, uh, we've described it this way with characters particularly like Zangief where your life bar is just basically currency to spend in order to win, right? In order to win. So, you know, trying to get a perfect every time is not, not necessarily an indication that you're better than the opponent. It just means that particular round, you had a really good read on them. But you can win rounds convincingly, quote convincingly, and still lose half your life just because you took that half a life to figure out information. So um, the example I, I gave in response to the guy on YouTube is that uh, when I played Zangief versus Guile players in Hyper Fighting and in Super Turbo, I would walk up and block sonic booms like 10 times in a row. And I didn't care I was losing all that chip damage because what I'm just trying to do is raise the Guile player's confidence in throwing sonic booms so that I can finally jump over it early so he does not, be, he is not, so basically if I react to sonic boom and jump over, he can still counter me. But if I get him into a rhythm and a pattern and I jump like right when he throws the sonic boom, now I have an advantage I can get in, and that may have just been the one opening I needed to win the entire round. So um, back to Mark's question, you know, what kind of things are you trying to establish? Um, yeah, you can do things like try to throw multiple fireballs, jump at the opponent. If they're a fireball player, jump at them a lot. See what they like to do. Um, you know, try to get a read if they're aggressive players or defensive players. This is a kind of category you can figure out. Um, you can get, also get a read on, there can be such thing as aggressive players who are not risk takers. Um, so you can get a read on whether they're risk takers or very, very conservative, 
an example of a rushdown player who's not a risk taker is they will do the offensive option that's very safe. So let's say you're a Marvel player, you're always going to attack when you call in your assist to back you up. Whereas there's some players who may just go in if they don't have that kind of safety. So that's more of a risk taker. But they're both offensive players. They're both aggressive players. So um, that's another category you can take. Um, you know, there's just all sorts of little subtle things that you can build in your mind about the archetypes of players. And uh, once you do that, um, when you play against your opponents, see someone like Daigo has an advantage that he's played against thousands upon thousands of players and so he's been able to squeeze them all into these little archetypes here and there so as soon as he starts playing a player he can recognize the archetype a little faster so I will say that you know this does come with experience if you don't play a lot of matches and this is why it's very useful to play online if your game has good online and Street Fighter 4 has decent online but um if you play a a large volume of matches you start getting a better idea and subconsciously you'll start putting people into categories and such but if you're a strong player that's thinking about it then like Daigo then it won't happen subconsciously it'll happen very very consciously so um, but yeah the, um, it's really hard to say because I mean I could give you a bunch of examples of more categories you can pick but um, I don't even know what categories Daigo has, to be honest with you. And, and, you know, he may have some kind of read that nobody else does for categorizing players. It's really depending on how you see the game and how you view opponents and how your game plan goes. You know, if you yourself are like, let's say you're a Marn player and you just like to go in and go crazy and stuff like that, you start trying to figure out whether or not your opponent is a, an uppercut masher or not and stuff like that. And... Someone like Daigo may not even care about that. It might not be something that he needs to categorize. So it really is dependent on your style. When you play against people, start trying to, you know, take that subconscious part of your mind that can recognize what people are doing and start putting it into your own archetypes that suit your play style. So, um... Um... Uh, uh, yeah, and uh, Mr. Masters is absolutely right. He says archetypes aren't static, they are dynamic. Good players can switch it up anytime. He's absolutely right, and this is what makes better players better players, is that they can switch it up on you. You'll often see someone like Daigo, uh, I mean, sorry, like someone like Vi, play very, very patient in game one, beat the opponent, and then all of a sudden in game two just start going crazy with fireballs, and he switches it up. And that's a strength of a strong player. Um, that is, if you can change, uh, uh, and actually someone asked me a question, um, I'm not sure if I have it marked down, but he basically said, how do you break your own habits? How do you learn to break your own habits? And um, if you remember last week, I said one of the problems with the expert players is when you get to the point where you're smart and you know what you're supposed to do, your weakness is that you're smart and you know what you're supposed to do. Because then the top players out there always know you're going to do the right thing. So they already have the counter to the right thing. They can turn all of your right things into wrong things uh, instantly. So, you know, the top players are the ones who are able to change their own style at, at a, on a whim. On a, you know, just like from game to game, round to round, or even moment to moment. Like they'll just sense this moment. Oh, he's scared. Now it's time for me to rush in. Um, that's... Yeah, that's definitely when you have to really start playing at the highest levels. But, you know, from a beginning standpoint, if you're just trying to break into the intermediate level, if you're trying to break into the expert level, that's um, that's where it kind of gets a little... Actually, sorry, my bad. When I said expert, I meant advanced because I had beginner, intermediate, advanced, and expert, and then pro was at the end. So when you get into the advanced point, that's when the experts can beat you up easily because you're always doing the right thing. So yeah, um, that's definitely something that's uh, very important to know is that once you start getting into the realm where it's expert versus experts and experts versus pros, the archetype stuff, putting people in categories is not going to be as easy and it's not going to be as effective and a lot more is going to happen on the fly. But, but, but I will still say this and I said that, said this last episode, even top players have patterns. Even the top players have patterns. That's why Infiltration's notes work so well, 
right? I mean, uh, last year in 2012, when he defeated Daigo, you could tell he had a very distinct read on Daigo's fireball game even before walking into that match. Because as soon as the match they played in 2012 happened, he was blowing up Daigo's fireball all day long. So um, there was definitely uh, a pattern he read. I can't tell you what it is because if I could, then I would be as good as they do. They are, but I'm not. So uh, I can't tell you what it is. But even top players have patterns. They can still fall into little bits of archetypes, but it's just, you know, it's not as wide. It's not as obvious. So, okay, let's go on to another question here. So, um, I, I think I've answered this one before. Um, so I apologize if I answered this one again, but it's again, I mean, these are a lot of these questions people ask multiple times. So, uh, I got the question of what is a fuzzy guard and what's a chicken guard. Um, I hate the term fuzzy guard so much because it meant like 7,000 other things. And now it means something completely different and it's been completely obfuscated the, the original meaning is completely messed up fuzzy guard used to be more of a defensive thing where you can get people to you can block multiple things by like wiggling the joystick up and down or back and forth and block multiple things and now all of a sudden fuzzy guard has turned into this term thanks to street fighter 4 people use it to um, talk about that phenomenon of where if a character is standing right when they start crouching you can hit them. Uh, I could probably show you guys an example of this if I just uh, turned it on really quick. Give me a second, guys. Uh, rather than just explaining it, let me actually show you guys a picture. Let me show you guys what it looks like. Uh, and, uh, let me switch over here. And you see this, I have Guilty Gear up. And it's not going to be Guilty Gear because Guilty Gear does not have this problem. Um, instead, what I am going to do is play Super Street Fighter 4. Um, basically, the best way to talk about fuzzy guards is it's a way to get your opponent... Ooh, listen to that CD hum. <laughs> loud, loud-ass Xbox 360. Um, fuzzy guard basically is a way to get an opponent crouching but still be extremely tall so that you can hit them with overhead attacks that you otherwise normally would not be able to hit them with. So, um, here, it's so hard to explain this without showing you guys, so I'm just going to do this real quick. Let's do the easiest one first here. Let's try to do it with, um, who's a particularly low crouching character? Let's try jury here. So I'm going to do jury here. And I'm going to be going up against an Adon. Okay, so let's see if we can do this here. So normally if jury is crouching, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to make Adon do um, instant jump roundhouse like that, right? So if I play back here, you know, Adon's going to jump kick me like this. If I'm crouching here, you see that Adon's jump roundhouse cannot hit me right if he jump roundhouses right away like that, right? It's just it's just not going to hit. So if I do this instead, oops. Yeah. Like that. Okay, now let's see what happens if I try this again. If I did it right. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to block the jump attack and immediately crouch. And, oh, okay, I'm going to get in the corner here so I can do it a little bit easier. All right, let me try one more time. Is that just too far, maybe? Here, let me do it one more time here. All right. See if I got this to work this time. Oof, just missed it. Sorry guys, this, I mean, um, jury, no, jury should be just fine. That was definitely not it. Oops. Okay, was that 
it. Let's see. Oh, this. Oh, just. Jury might actually be too too low, <laughs> to be honest with you. But I, it shouldn't matter. It shouldn't matter. It shouldn't matter. So let's try this. Oops. Actually, let me try it on cross up. It might actually be easier. Let me start that again. Yeah, actually, that might be better. So let's see here. So I'm gonna block this and. Oof. Just missed it. Let's see if I can. Yeah, I just missed it. Let me try another character here, really quick. <laughs> shouldn't matter. It shouldn't matter. Uh, let's just try Ryu here. <laughs> so basically, what it what it really is going on is that once I block the jump attack, I'm I'm stuck in a block stun while standing. In the transition for me to try to crouch block, what's gonna happen is that um. What's gonna happen is that Ryu is gonna start crouching, so you can see like that, like right there. You can see how Ryu is just starting to crouch a little bit. He's technically in crouching position, but he's still really tall. So what's gonna happen is if I did this right, like that, I got hit right there, right? But let's see if I just stay blocking. If I stay low blocking this entire time here, you can see how the jump roundhouse cannot hit Ryu, right? Jump Roundhouse cannot hit a Crouching Ryu. It doesn't hit high enough. But if I block this and then I low block, boom, boom, I actually get hit. Because what happens is I high block the cross up and then I immediately crouch. And while Ryu is trying to crouch, he goes into crouching state, but he still counts as being tall because he's starting that crouch. So now Adon's Jump Roundhouse can hit me in the head because it's an overhead and I'm tall enough for it to connect even though I'm counted as crouching. So this is what Fuzzy Guard is refers to now. This is what Fuzzy Guard has become in the realm of Street Fighter 4 and Marvel vs. Capcom 3. It works in both of those games and if, I, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, it doesn't work in any other game. I believe these, these are the only two that this weird phenomenon happens. Oh, Cross Tekken. It's probably another one since it's built off of the uh, Street Fighter 4 engine. So this is what a fuzzy guard is. Basically, you block something and then you get the free jump attack on people. And um, it works really good, especially in Marvel, because you get you get chains and assists that you can keep it going. Uh, Adon, if I'm not mistaken, can also do... Um, let me see. He can also do like... Like that. And that'll combo on some characters when they try to... Um, when they try to crouch block and say it's probably not going to work at them. It only works on super tall characters. But in any case, that's what a fuzzy guard is. It's basically what happens when your character, uh, you can trick the game into the game believing that you're still standing height, but you're crouching so jump attacks will hit you. Chicken guard. Chicken guard is a term that's used mostly in... Uh, games like Marvel where air blocking can block everything and chicken blocking is basically holding up back and trying to block everything you can in the air because as long as you're chicken blocking in the air uh, you don't have to worry about high low mix ups you only have to worry about left right mix ups so whenever you hear people say nice chicken guard or okay that's a really good chicken guard or he should chicken guard it just basically means trying to block an onslaught while holding up back that's what uh, chicken guarding means so it's the opposite. In Street Fighter, the default is down back that you want to block. In Marvel, the default is up back that you want to block. One of the hardest things to figure out in transition. I'm that's that's me speaking from my own personal experience. I'm really terrible at chicken blocking because I just want to hold down back because I'm so I'm so stuck on Street Fighter mentality. Okay, so let me get to another question here. Um, so, um, oh, I can't even pronounce this. Uh, uh, oh, I'll just call him Richard because that's a lot easier to say than his username here. So Richard asks me the question, uh, last season I did a, an episode on this concept of attack vectors. And um, I, I related a lot to a, an article that Seth Killian wrote for Domination 101 about um, controlling space how to view the battlefield, that kind of thing like that. 
Um, he says he's watched it, but he's not sure how to control space safely. Um, he's starting to understand the actual attack vectors concept, but he can't figure out what distances he's actually able to control the space of on the battlefield. So every time he thinks he's safe to throw a fireball without being punished, he gets punished, right? So um, he doesn't know if he's just being too predictable with the tiger shot or if he's just throwing it at the wrong moment. So basically his question is, how can I use training mode to help me learn when I'm actually in control of the battlefield space? Or is this only something I can learn from playing others over and over again? Um, the hardest thing, honestly, is that uh, controlling space is a strangely passive concept and also a very, very matchup heavy concept. Um, the way controlling space works is you control an area of the screen that your opponent has trouble uh, controlling. So for example, Ryu against Honda. Fireball controls the whole vertical space in front of there because Honda really his only option is to jump over the fireball, which makes him very vulnerable if, if you throw the fireball as well. If he does a butt slam, you can usually just stay out of the distance and sweep him and such like that. So you're controlling that whole space in front of you. However, if you're playing against a character who has really easy ways to get through fireballs and punish you, you can't control that space anymore. So controlling space is a very, very um, matchup dependent thing. Secondly, when you control a space, largely it's a very passive thing. You don't actively have to control space. You just have to establish that you have control over it. Think of it like one of those military games where you take over territories. Once you've taken over that territory, you control that space. So let's say you're Adon versus someone like... Um, uh, who has really bad normal, well, not bad normal moves, but like who has like poor range. Let's say it's just Adon versus Zangief, right? Zangief, uh, Zangief is a bad example because he can beat it. So let's do T-Hawk. Um, Adon versus T-Hawk. Adon, his standing roundhouse controls the space in front of him so good because it's really hard for T-Hawk to beat that stand roundhouse. It's hard for T-Hawk to whiff punish that stand roundhouse. And, you know, trying to risk jumping over it to punish him punish him is a bad idea and if you focus a lot of the times the roundhouse uh, hits it twice right so Adon will control that space right in front of him very well now the interesting thing about it is if you kick in that space like once and hit T-Hawk and then like maybe whiff kick it one more time you've already established now that you control that space you never need to kick there ever again to really get him to understand that anymore. If your opponent is a smart player, he will understand that you have claimed that space now. Now he has to respect that and stay just outside of your roundhouse distance. Otherwise, as soon as he walks in there, he knows you're gonna hit roundhouse and you're gonna win. So you've already established that you controlled that space. That is, that's kind of an interesting concept with space control, is once you've established it, you know, every once in a while you may want to show the opponent that, yeah, 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 I still got the space. You know, give him a little bit of a reminder. So if you're Adon and you're walking around and you're never kicking, you know, every once in a while, well, it's safe, you can kick once in a while. But then it's impossible to predict, right? So in this case that Richard was talking about, he's using Sagat, trying to throw tiger shots. And every time he thinks it's safe to throw one, he throws one and the opponent predicts it. It's because... Honestly, if you're already dominating that space, you don't have to throw tiger shots to control that space. In fact, if the opponent is just trying to figure out a way to punish that fireball because you've established that space, that's when you start faking, and that's when you start getting them to jump, and that's when you start uppercutting them out of the air. So, okay. So, um, that's a very simple way to answer that question, but, um... You know, it does help to play other people. You can't really learn how to control space while playing on training mode because you really have to understand the matchup. Uh, again, you know, low tiger shots, for example, are better. Like, for example, Ryu can control fireball space in front of Honda, but Honda can headbutt over low tiger shots, so low tiger shots don't control that space as well as Ryu's fireball does against Honda. It's very, very matchup dependent on who controls what space. And then from that point forward, you know, if you're playing against, and this goes back to reading your opponent, if you're playing against a, a beginner opponent, you can probably just let them come into that space and beat them up over and over and over again. Intermediate player will start figuring out, I can't get into this space because I keep getting beat up, even though that's not how they're 
processing it. They're just they just know that they keep getting hit there. And then the advanced player will start understanding to respect that area and try to counter it and try to figure out a way around it. But um, against you know beginner players, if you're controlling that space, let them hang themselves over and over again. Let them come into that space and beat them up uh, all the time. So, okay, let's go to another question here. Um, oh, okay, this one I really want to get to in a future episode. This is more of an execution corner thing here. Um, okay, this is actually a really good question. This actually has to do with uh, David's episode last week. Um, he asked, uh, Nelson asks the question, uh, David mentioned that Hakan's Ultra has one more active frame than Zangief, so it's three as opposed to two. So therefore, Hakan's Ultra 1 can be used as anti-air. I'm assuming that Zangief's U1 can't be used as anti-air because it only has two active frames. So my question is, why does the three-frame ultra anti-air, but a two-frame ultra can't? And uh, the answer to that is, you have to think of it this way. Um, there's one piece of advice that I've always given everybody um, for Zangief's ultra. If he activates the ultra, so the first frame that it's activated is frame one. Frame two is right when the freeze animation stops and he tries to grab. And then three, frame three from that point forward is nothing. Right, he can't grab anymore because he only has two active frames, right? Wait, what are you saying, David? Two active frames, yeah. yeah, two active frames, right? So what happens is, normally when Zangief activates the Ultra, if you're standing right next to him and you kind of think you're in range, but you're not sure, most people hold up back to run away from Zangief, right? The thing about it is, though, is that you can technically hold forward at him because... He's going to grab you on that first frame, or he's not going to grab you on that first frame, right? So it's, it's kind of weird. I don't know how to explain it. It's really, that is the second active frame that's coming right out of it. So once you start holding forward on the controller, he has no more active frames to grab you. So there's no way you can walk into it and get grabbed. If he's grabbing you, he grabbed you. If, he, if, you, if you are out of range... There's no way you can get grabbed at that point forward. So if you ever see Zangief activate an Ultra, you're not sure if you're close enough and you hadn't held up already, there's no reason to try to jump away from it, hold forward, and get your biggest punish on him because he can't grab you. Now this is not going to be the case with Hakan, because Hakan has an extra active frame after the Ultra animation stops. So now if you're one frame walk distance outside of his range, and he activates his ultra, if you walk forward and in that one frame you walk into his range, he will grab you. <laughs> and the, so against Hakan, if you see him activate the ultra, holding up can be a way, it is a practical thing to do to escape it. So the reason why it works as an anti-air is because if you're one frame away from landing on the ground, if Zangief activates the ultra while you're one frame away from landing on the ground, the next frame when you land on the ground, you're not going to get grabbed because you, he just does not have the ability to grab anymore at that point in time. But Hakan does. He has that one extra frame where he's going to grab. So even if he activates the Ultra when you're one frame off the ground, as soon as you land, he still has that extra frame and he's going to grab you. Now, again, the, the way the throws ultras, throw Ultras work, I know it's two active frames, and I'm not 100% sure how that works out because I know there's only really one frame where you can kind of get grabbed. So I'm not exactly sure how that works. I don't know if David knows anything more than I do about it or anything. Um, just cause, cause like it's two active frames, but if you're like outside of Zangief range when he activates it, you can't walk into it on the next frame. I suppose you can, although I don't, one frame out of 60 is- Yeah, it's, it's, it's really, active. it's kind of weird. So um, I've never seen that happen. But um, since Hakan has more active frames, he can use it as, a, as an anti-air and you can land in it. So there you go. Um, so let's do one more question. I'll go on break and I'll do a couple of execution corners. Um, so the last question I have here is... Actually, no, I want to save that one because that one's a pretty long question here. Um, about this one here. This one has to do with Marvel... Actually, no, you know what? Uh, I'm going to stop here for the Ask Jay Chenzer questions. I'm going to take a break real quick, and when we come back, uh, I'm going to do some execution corner stuff. 
And uh, if you guys have any questions on stream, unfortunately, I'm not looking at chat right now. I keep glancing at it, but it's really hard for me to read long questions. So if you do have any questions, feel free to type right now while I am on break. And uh, we will I will see if I can answer some stuff uh, when I come back. So... All right, everybody, welcome back to First Attack. I am James Chen. Here beside me is my co-host, Nathan, who is chilling down here. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to trans over, transition over to a little bit of Execution Corner here. And um, what I want to do now, this is actually cool for me, what I really want to do here is go into some Guilty Gear. There we are. So let me second, let me get this all set up from camera views. Um, now loading. So Guilty Gear, obviously a game with high uh, execution. Uh, so there, uh, this is very loud. So there's actually a lot of, um, there's actually a lot of situations where it can be really, really hard to actually get these combos going. So let's do a couple of these. Uh, I have one Johnny combo here, so um, let's try to do this here. Let me see. And I have to pick my color, of course. Now, he sends me a, an example in a combo video here. So tricky thing about this game is that so a lot of times combos only work on certain characters. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to check to see what character it's on. So that way I can pick the same character and make sure I can do this here. Let's see, he says it happens at 2.34 here. So let's jump to 2.34 and see who he does this combo on. Come on YouTube, you can load. You can do it. You can do it! Uh, looks like he's doing it on Soul. Okay, gotcha. So let's go back to the question here. So what he's trying to do here is, um, let's see. Oops, I'm looking at the wrong one. Back to this one here. Let's see. Okay, so here we go. Let's do this. He's doing it against Soul. Sorry, guys. All right. <laughs> I know my cat is like, look, I'm gonna show you how to do this, okay? Because you're terrible at this. Um, goodbye. So, the combo that he wants to do, he wants to see work here is um, basically level two miss finer start, which I believe I'm on here. Let's see, level two fix, yeah. So he wants uh, miss finer coin OTG, and then another miss finer. Boom, like this, and then what he wants to do is the um, the the two three six hearts. Oh, another coin into Joker trick like this. So basically, uh, let's see if I can get this like that. So that's what he wants to try to do. But what he says is he can't seem to link the uh, killer Joker. I call it Joker trick again. Sorry, uh, the killer Joker after the coin. Um, and not only that, he can't ever seem to false Roman cancel it, so, um, let's get this, so one, so what happens is, you just, your mind is going to tell you to, you, you have this rhythm, right, so you're like one, two, one, two, and then one of the biggest problems is that you start watching the coin. You start watching the coin going after him and you're just kind of looking at it, right? So this is what's going to happen a lot of times when you try combos. You're going to hit with a Miss Finer, coin, Miss Finer, and then you're going to try to make sure that that coin hits. And then when it hits, you're like, okay, now I'm going to come out with the killing joke, right? So, uh, killing joker here, so... Let's try that one more time. And you see how it missed right there. The problem, what you have to tell yourself is that you need to do it as fast as humanly possible. So you don't want to wait at all for the coin to hit. You just want to go as fast as you can. So. Oops. Like that. 
and then just <laughs> mash on S. That's that's exactly what I'm doing. Like that. So now I can get that part to connect. And again, once I throw the second coin, I'm not even paying attention to what the coin is doing. I'm only looking at Johnny now. Because I want to make sure that I get the killing joker as soon as the coin ends. And that's what's going to let me to get that uh, hit in there. Now, the question really comes down to is how do you false Roman cancel this uh, consistently? And the biggest problem with this is that every time, as soon as it hits, that's a regular Roman cancel. I don't know if you guys can see it on the stream, but every time I do it, it's a red Roman cancel. And remember, that little thing at the bottom of the screen will actually give you an indication of when you can false Roman cancel it. It's super fast, though. I don't even know if you could see it on the stream properly. But um, what happens here is that what you learn is that if you do it slow like this, Listen to the button presses again. Oh, wow, I'm using silent. I have silent buttons on right now, so you can't hear the the, 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 the the loud noises that I normally get on my joystick. I should probably use the other controller. Oof. Ah. My headphones do not have the, 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 the long range. Hang on. Let me switch over to this really quick. I think I have it downstairs. You guys are SOL. You're just going to have to deal with silent buttons for now. Um, yes, this is Accent Core Plus. You guys are watching right now. So, Okay, so the controller's back. Basically, what you're just going to have to realize is that the timing for it is not when it hits, but ever slightly after it hits. So if you can just practice doing this as much as you can. Okay, that's too slow. Okay, that's perfect right there. So, bop, 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 bop. Oops. Bop, bop. Bop, bop. Yeah. Bop, bop. That's too fast. Bop, bop. Too fast. Okay, that's perfect right there. So just sit here and practice this as much as you can until you can get this a little bit consistently. The hardest part now though is that when you're doing the combo here, you're mashing slash to try to get it as fast as you can, right? So what you wanna do is use use the animation of Johnny actually hitting with that move because the, the, the false Roman cancel point, the forced Roman cancel point is always gonna be a certain number of frames after that. So if you can get the timing you know, from when you see the move hit, and then learn that timing to false Roman cancel, that's gonna help a lot. And again, if you can't false Roman cancel consistently, just understand, it is not easy to do. It is not an easy thing to do because it's only like two or three frames, I think this one is, that you can get for the false Roman cancel point. So if you want to do the whole entire combo now, um, what you want to do is... Oops. What the fault is it? See, now here's another problem. This actually happens a lot uh, when you're trying to do combos. You're thinking so much about that false Roman cancel that it really is delaying your execution of the killing joker. This is a big problem too. A lot of times, see, now I'm thinking about it, so I was trying to do it fast, but then I gotta think about the false Roman cancel. And honestly, one of the best ways to do this is just to keep doing it until it becomes kind of muscle memoried. Oops. Mm, yeah, see, that's hard. Yeah, 
See, I'm thinking so much about the Roman cancel that I'm not getting the oops. I'm not getting the other one properly. Okay, so that was the regular Roman cancel there, right there. So, um, let's try one more time. Well, I'm doing the coin too early. Yeah, see, I'm just, I'm just mashing Roman cancel out. And it, this is kind of one of those things that you just got to train your brain not to do that. This definitely is a very high level combo. I would not call this bread and butter by any means. I don't think this is a combo that you really need to learn for this character. There's definitely a lot easier things that you can do than this. But now I'm intent on doing this, which is what always happens to me on these. <laughs> The other thing too, um, you might want to learn is not to mash on that, so to actually just learn to, to, to get it out without mashing like that to do it as fast as possible. Well, I got the blue cancel there. So what's happening now is that um, I'm, not igno I'm, I'm basically ignoring my original advice. I'm not looking at Johnny to know when I can do the killing joker after that. Yeah, see now that I'm paying attention to that. Now I'm paying attention to Johnny. Yeah, see now I'm getting that part a little consistently. Now I just have to make sure I do that that was too slow. Yeah, see now I'm just doing that a little bit too fast. So yeah, I mean it's 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 this is definitely a very difficult combo here. And again, there's definitely a lot of easier things to do besides this crazy combo to get some good stuff going on in the corner here because if you can hit him with this kind of setup, uh, it's kind of impractical to be honest with you. It looks cool if you can do it. Oops. See, I just keep doing a, 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 I'm keep doing the red cancel there. And the reason why is because I'm not thinking about the timing properly now. Ooh, okay, that time I was thinking about it properly, but I just still did it too early. It's weird because I'm trying to delay my Roman cancel, but what that ends up doing is making me delay when I hit the second button for the for the actual killing joker. So there's just a lot of things that you have to train your muscle memory to doing. Oh, I think I just got it there, didn't I? I think that was blue cancel right there. Really hard to tell, really hard to tell. But um, I think I got it, so. And usually, you know, that's the thing too, is just to keep trying it over and over and over again. But uh, yeah, this is definitely um, just one of those things that you just got to practice. And really the hardest part about this combo is the, the, the blue Roman cancel point at that. And uh, yeah, honestly, that's just the best way is you're just going to have to keep practicing at it. Keep trying to get that rhythm. And don't let the rhythm of that one part mess up the rhythm of all your other parts. So. Uh, let me go to another character here so I can do a different combo. Your um, okay, so this question here is from a Faust player. He is having trouble getting this combo to work. Uh, let's see, jump two kick and then do the little down trick. Oh my god, what the heck color did I just pick? Jeez. So he wants jump kick, 
and then instantly down. So can you chain that? I don't think you can. So what he wants to do is jump to kick, jump to kick here, and then uh, so he just wants to start this up. Oops, I'm not holding down back. Into jump kick like that. So he wants that part. And once he lands the jump kick, land far slash hard slash like this into so far so far slash hard slash into fireball slash that move right there and then he wants the roman cancel it dash 2s so he basically wants um to hit him while he's sliding there like that catch him while he's sliding then jump cancel jump kick slash kick double jump kick slash hard slash right so he's saying he's inconsistent with the follow-up with the dash after this. So in other words, he has the most trouble landing this dashing and getting Crouch S, that part right there. That's the part he's having the most trouble with. Um, and once he does get it, he can't get the aerial combo to connect at all. So let's see, let's see if I can, so. Jump, kick, land, so, and then land with slash. Oops. So what he wants to do is slash, hard slash. Uh, see, there you go. That's the problem. If you're too far away, a lot of the times it's not going to reach like that. So then you do kick, slash, kick. So let's try that again. So, I mean, this is honestly, I recommend... One of the things that you really want to learn to do is to learn to practice parts of your combos without everything else in front of it. Because you want to learn just these core parts of it. So if you learn how to do this first, it's better than trying to do the whole thing together a lot of the time. So, um, you know, learn this part. And what you really have to learn to do is one of the key things that you want to learn how to do is as soon as you Roman cancel this, you want to be running right away. So what happens is when you do quarter circle forward slash and you Roman cancel, you want to start dashing before you actually Roman cancel. So you actually want to tap forward, Roman cancel forward, essentially. And that way you can start running as soon as it runs out. So I'm doing it too fast. There you go. So that's what you want to learn how to do is to be running as soon as you Roman cancel it. If you Roman cancel it and then start running, you're too slow. You have to already be basically sprinting as soon as this connects, like that. So then if you can learn that timing, you will have a better chance of getting it to connect because the problem is if you connect with Crouch Slash from too far away, you're not going to be close enough for everything else to hit. Oh, wow, I'm always dashing too fast. And jump kick. See, there you go. Too slow. Oh, stupid dizzy soul. Yeah, so there you go. So that, that was a little bit better right there, right? So what you really have to do is, um, that's probably the key part of this, is learning how to run immediately out of that. Because the other thing too is that you want to get as far as you can so that the rest of it connects. Because if you're too far away, then... Um, that's why the rest of it is dropping here. Now, obviously, there's also a little bit of issues with uh, um, hit stun deterioration and stuff like that by getting the whole combo at the front. But but it's the only difference is you're just adding this jump kick here, which is not a big deal. Now, keep in mind that there probably will be distances where this combo just isn't possible at all. Yeah, as you can see from here, but that's not the part that's missing. So let's do this again. I'm really bad at this. If you're wondering what this is, is um, jump debt two kick is this is this yoga? So it's like a yoga mummy move. It's like it's like a dalsam drill, right? But basically, if you plink it, you can Kara cancel it so that he starts the move. But there's that green blocking thing in the air, right? So I can green block all day in the air like this, or if you hold back and or down back and hit any two buttons, that is not hard slash or dust, you can get the green blocking. So if I hold down back and hit two, I come out with that move. But if I base essentially plink it with another button, 
I start the Dalsum Dive, but then I Kara cancel that into um, the green block. And so what that essentially does is just gives Faust a little short hop. And so when you do that, you can get instant overheads this way, like that. So, really useful technique for Faust. See, right there, it's very far away, so... And so now you gotta just make sure you can run. Wow, that's fast. So, let's see if I can get the whole thing in here. <laughs> I'm not doing it fast enough. Wow. Okay, I cheated. I had the corner there. The corner was actually there to help me. So let's see if I can do this here. Oops. I'm gonna have the corner helping me again. So let's do this. Wow, why am I so bad at comboing after I land? Yeah, you can see right there, um, I didn't actually combo the whole entire thing, but you saw how, how I had to run pretty far just to get that to work. Oh man, why am I so bad at this green cancel thing? It's actually not that easy. That's really weird. It takes a lot longer to land than I think he's going to. So I keep missing that part. Yeah, see, that's the key right there. Is you gotta really learn how to be running right at the right time. Otherwise, you're never gonna be able to get this combo to go. Man, that part's really bothering me right there that I can't, that I'm having so much trouble comboing that part. As you saw right there, I didn't combo it again, so... Ooh, achievement unlocked. Nice. Yeah, see right there, it was a little far. Let's try that one more, one more time. Oops. Man, that part makes me angry. Here. I'm not gonna lie, that part is really freaking me out here that I cannot seem to combo jump kick into slash for some reason off of this. Ooh, so I ran for just a little too long there. So, just a little too long. But essentially, I had it in that one if I just did it fast enough. So that's weird. The streaming from PS3 is such a pain. I don't have the hardware for it. There's a specific piece of hardware that you need to be able to get that to work. So this is, yeah, this is definitely the old version of Guilty Gear. Sorry guys, this is not Plus R, as I said earlier. So sorry about that. So, um, yeah, so I guess, um, I mean, do you guys want me to move on or do you guys want to see, to see me keep doing this until I get it or, okay, never mind. I just got it right there. There you go. So there it was right there. I finally got it there. So, um, just got it. And, uh, yeah, it's very, it's very timing specific obviously but you just have to make sure that you run far enough that's the whole thing <laughs> oh, that's awesome I always do that don't I like okay I'm done and then I get it oh, that's the way it works so
And then the other important thing is just to keep doing it. Just keep doing it. After you land it once, switch sides, do it both directions, just keep doing it. And I don't know what it is about myself, but like usually as soon as I get a combo once, it becomes that much more consistent for me. I just have to like get it that one time so that my brain gets really happy about it. See, there you go. So now I've done it three times in a row. There you go. So, um, yeah, just keep doing it over and over and over and over and over again until you can get it to work. Um, I'll do one more and then I'll switch over to David. So, um, basically the question here from another guy here, let's see, um, from Tommy here is that he wants to know how to do sidewinder loops and he's really having trouble doing sidewinder loops. I don't know any of his actual sidewinder loops, but I know, oops, what is the code? There it is. I know basically the way you want a sidewinder loops to work is that you want to hit them with the sidewinder move like basically right in the middle of their sprite. So if they're right here, you want the punch to connect like right in the middle. And that's how you're going to be able to do it. And unfortunately, what makes that really hard is that every character has different heights and every character has different weights. So you're really good. See, that was too low right there. That was too low. So it's really up to you to experiment with the different characters, practice on each different one to learn what the right height is. And see, that one was probably a little too high. Okay, so it's not right in the middle. It's a little higher up. It's a little higher up. And again, I'm playing on the wrong version. I'm not playing on uh, Plus R, so I don't know if they, they changed it or not. But um, that is one of the things that you're going to want to have to figure out. And um, there's lots of different ways to do Sidewinder loops. Get it like... I think some people actually like do, do uh, ground-based attacks there before they jump cancel just to get better heights. You know, like that, or maybe even slash double jump, slash into Sidewinder. Oops. See right there, I did it too low. Oh, wow. Okay, so it is. It's, it's, it's the upper half. You gotta kind of punch him in the head, it looks like it. So... No, not that, not that high. So I would say probably about like two-thirds up their body, that's, that's where you want to hit them. So that one was probably too low. But I mean, your best bet, honestly, is going to be going to forums and uh, like Dustloop and reading basically what the, what the heights are that you want to get. You know, something like that. And they'll tell you, they'll, they'll probably have the best tips on how to, um, what do you want to call it? How to get the maximum number of sidewinders in there. But really, it's just about um, trying to get them at just the right height. That's just all it is right there. And uh, it's pretty tricky. But once you get it really down, it'll probably get easier and easier. I mean, that's just how combos work. But the biggest problem, of course, is that, like I said, since every character has different heights, that's a problem. Uh, the other question that he has here is just how to do gun flame pressure because he's having trouble blue canceling the fireball, right? So, um, one of the things um, I talked about before with Faust was being able to just come out of a move running, right? So one of the things about gun flame pressure that's really uh, valuable is just to learn to double tap the dash, you know, in the middle of your, in the middle of the false Roman cancel. It's so hard for me to talk and do this at the same time. So that way you're running right away, right? So, so that's that's one way to get better gun flame pressure is to learn how to be dashing already. So. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's probably the easiest way to do that, so... And uh, again, it's just about the timing. Now, here I want to mention one thing, though, that makes it a little bit tricky, though. Is if you learn to do it like this, and, um... And learn the Roman cancel point on this, like, really well, right? So... Um, I had it, now I've lost it. Gunflame! Gunflame! There it is, Gunflame. A little after he finishes stop moving, it looks like. There it is. Okay, so 
the tricky thing about it is if you learn that timing, like let's say you learn the bop bop timing, right? So you're like bop bop, bop bop, bop bop, bop bop. I bet you if I did it. Well, the main point that I'm trying to show you right now is even if you learn this cool timing of this, you know, if you learn the rhythm properly just by doing it empty like this. Wow, I was doing it earlier. No, I can't do it at all. There it is. Well, once you learn this timing, the tricky part about it is if you do, for example, slash hard slash and then try to do it, the timing changes. Your timing is actually different now. The timing in which you want to Roman cancel this changes. It becomes slower. And the reason why for this is the hit stop. You know when a move hits like this, like it freezes like this for a few seconds, right? I mean, for a few frames. So in other words, if I whiff, it animates a certain speed, like this. Like he freezes in that position right here. He freezes in this position for a couple of frames. If I don't hit him, it whiffs, right? Well, if you think about that then, if I'm just throwing a gun flame here like this and, learn, and I've learned how to Roman cancel it properly like that, if I hit a hard slash and then fireball, they go into that hit freeze. So basically what happens is I can do this. And as soon as that hits, if I've entered my gunflame code in here, the game is still gonna freeze for a few frames no matter what before the gunflame comes out. So I can enter the gunflame code as soon as this touches and then there'll be a few frames of that hit freeze and then the gun flame comes out. Now all of a sudden, the time to Roman cancel the gun flame is about three or four frames later. And that's a problem, right? So, you see how quickly I hit the gun flame? Like I can do like that, right? See, I've already entered it. And so what's going to happen then is the gun flame is going to come out a few frames later. So basically I can sit here and practice this while I'm blue in the face. You know, this gun flame Roman cancel until I'm blue in the face. And then all of a sudden when I do this, I do the same timing and it's not going to come out. So now basically the, the answer is now you're going to have to just to learn how to practice it off of the hard slash. Like that. You just want to learn a separate timing to it. Or if you're really, really, really good and you are very visual, you can use the uh, visual cue of Soul doing it. Wow, why is it so much easier for me to do it this way? I don't even know. Wow, okay. I don't know what's going on. But in any case, obviously I can do it better um, from slash hard slash than I can, <laughs> than I can by itself. But you can see how because of the way that you enter the gun flame, it can change your timing. So you definitely need to practice both uh, systems like that. And uh, I will say that I'm really sad that they got, didn't they? Oh no, no, they got rid of it in this one. I really love that slash combo, but I can't do it anymore. But in any case, um, those are three things from Guilty Gear right there. Um, let me change camera views here. So, uh, yeah, if you guys are having trouble with more Guilty Gear stuff, you know, by all means, send me stuff that you guys need help with because I would be more than happy to do more Guilty Gear stuff. <laughs> I would love to learn as many characters as I can. Problem is, right now, obviously, I'm streaming on the wrong system. Fortunately, a lot of those combos still worked even on uh, this version. They weren't uh, particularly specific to Accent Core. So, uh, Axar, it's not particular to Accent Core plus R. Um, hopefully they come out with this soon on Xbox. I don't know what the heck is taking them so long. I've tried streaming the PS3 using the component cables and it wasn't working very well at all. I was having trouble with it. Also, um, I'm going to be trying to use a different streaming program pretty soon at some point in time. Hopefully that'll work and make things better as well. But um, that's all I got right now. If you guys have any more questions for Ask J. Chenzor, Please send them to me at ultrachentv at gmail.com with the subject line of Ask J. Chenzor. And if you have some Execution Corner stuff you'd like me to try to do, send it to the same email address with the um, uh, subject line of Execution Corner. Uh, before I do leave, I do want to give a shout out to um, a couple of guys. Uh, 
Well, actually, you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll save it for tomorrow. So, okay. Um, that's it. Uh, stay tuned for Level 3 Focus. I think David's going to be covering uh, Justin Wong's team in Marvel uh, at EVO. So that's definitely going to be hype. So check that out, guys. And I will talk to you all later. Peace.